All right. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, welcome to another in the series of the National Security Policy Speaker Series, uh, co-sponsored by uh, CPAC at UCSD and the Korean Institute. Um, we're very fortunate today uh, to have Lieutenant General uh, Wallace Chip Gregson uh, to speak to us. Uh, General Gregson has a, a wealth of experience that's relevant to our uh, community here on the Pacific Rim. He served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs uh, from 2009 to 2011. He's worked as a civilian advisor on military affairs. Um, He's also, he was also in his military service, the commanding general of the Marine Forces in the Pacific and Marine Forces Central Command, two very, uh, let's say, interesting parts of the world to be, um, to be in a leadership position. Um, he was uh, commanding general of all Marine Forces in Japan previously, um, and there he received a number of uh, extraordinary medals. Uh, he was awarded the Japanese Order of the Rising Sun and the Korean Order of National Security Merit, uh, Gyeksun Medal, which I didn't know existed, um, but I imagine looks fascinating. Um, prior to um, commanding the Japanese, uh, the Marine Corps forces in Japan, he was the director of the Asian Pacific Policy uh, Office at, for the Secretary of Defense. Um, he served for his entire career in the Marine Corps a military career in the Marine Corps. After graduating from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1968, he's a combat veteran of Vietnam, earned a bronze star with a V device for valor uh, and a Purple Heart, uh, all of which is uh, not something easy to accomplish. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, General Gregson. I look forward to his comments. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric, for the uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, the bit in there about awarded the Purple Heart, that's always struck me as a bit strange. It, uh, 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 one of the people, one of the dignitaries that came to visit when I was on a hospital ship stuck out his hand and said, congratulations. Okay, I got it. It's, it's anyway. Uh, the other thing was, uh, along with all those duties that he mentioned, um, I am now genuinely a civilian twice. Uh, my wife will tell you that I failed of retirement twice. But one of the interesting things is I got most of my Second Amendment, or First Amendment rather, First Amendment rights back. So with only rare exception, I'm allowed to speak my mind. And that's, that's, that's a luxury uh, when you're finally retired from all these jobs. Uh, thank you all for coming. I realize we're competing with a uh, mega event on Tiananmen Square somewhere else on the campus, uh, so I'll try and make it worth your while to be here. What I'd like to talk about is the Indo-Pacific region and what's going on there, uh, the, the massive area of the world from the east coast of Africa all the way across the Pacific Ocean, north and south from Japan to Australia, et cetera, et cetera, which is supposed to be the area of the future where the largest middle class is growing, where we want to do business, and in my opinion, where an awful lot of problems reside now. Uh, China, North Korea, and Russia seek fundamental changes in the international operating system. Five countries out there have nuclear weapons, most notably North Korea who proved willing and capable of deploying and employing a weapon of mass destruction, in this case, VX nerve gas in Malaysia in February of 2017. The rulers of North Korea and China are there for life. They'll leave office only by coup or by coffin, and compromise is impossible. China's territorial creation and acquisition theft of in and theft of intellectual property threatens the international system. China declared undisputed historical sovereignty over the entire South China Sea, an area half again larger than the Mediterranean Sea. Imagine if Libya or Italy had declared ownership of the Mediterranean. Xi Jinping's New Year's speech was all about Taiwan and the clock running out on reunification. There was a clear threat there. Xi publicly called for Taiwan to rejoin China under the one country, two systems model that's been discredited in, in Hong Kong where they first applied it. China successfully interfered 
in last November's local elections in Taiwan. Russian territorial seizure in Crimea, Ukraine and the Sea of Azov, global cybercrime and dangerous decline all augur for instability. The largest and second largest national populations are out there in, the, in, the, in this region and number two, India will overtake number one, China by 2030. The world's largest and second largest Muslim national populations are in the region. We have five treaty allies, Taiwan, other security and trading partners comp uh, comprising our interests out there. The largest middle class population in the world is in Southeast Asia and it's still growing. The region's also home to many violent extremist organizations. Millions are held in captivity in China and North Korea. The minority Rohingya population flees Myanmar to escape persecution, destabilizing things in Bangladesh. China is exploiting artificial intelligence, massive national surveillance, and emerging 5G technology to create a pervasive surveillance state and assign citizen scores for all Chinese people. This technology will be exportable to like-minded authoritarian rulers to better control their people. Our adversaries deploy political, diplomatic, economic, paramilitary, legal, and military coercion just below the level of conflict. China's paramilitary forces, their Coast Guard, and the People's Armed Forces Maritime Militia are consolidating control over the entirety of the Yellow Sea, the East China Sea, and the South China Sea. Nations bordering these seas are being forced to abandon their commercial efforts, primarily fishing. You'll recall that we famously stated we're going to fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Carrier battle groups are wonderful things, but they, they don't do much to the Vietnamese and the Philippine fishermen, for example, that are being bullied out of their fishing areas by the Chinese. Our efforts to counter this coercion enhance and to enhance our deterrence are not effective. Authoritarian leaders, in my opinion, are not out competing us. We're not competing. We're admiring the problem, not solving it. Our economy is still dominant, but we're not defending it against competition from state-owned corporations. Our military forces and those of our allies are an essential part of the solution, but only a part. We can't operate without the other parts. Most important, We've forgotten why we're the shining city on the hill for much of the rest of the world. We're not defending the idea behind America. And the challenge is us. We need to remember who we are. We used to be very good at big things. We used to know how to organize our policies and strategies around a central organizing vector or set of principles that gained the support of our own people and those of other nations. Nearly 30 years ago, Ancient history, I realize, for most of us in the room, not all of us, the Berlin Wall, a dawning symbol of communist ideology and rule, collapsed. This marked the end of the Cold War, an existential struggle between the free world led by the U.S. and the communist bloc. It ended without yet another great power war, which was at that point a rarity for the 20th century. This was not by accident. Our second set of founding fathers in the closing days of World War II set up a global system that reflected our values, promoted international cooperation, ensured our security, and provided a better alternative than the colonialism, imperial rule, and predatory trade practices that twice brought global devastation between 1914 and 1945. The big idea that organized our policies and strategies was drawn from the universal values that formed our country. Foreign policy and national security grew from our domestic politics and security. We could not have done this alone and we did not. The genius of American diplomacy was building institutions that would advance American interests by serving others. Let me repeat that and if you gotta leave early, this is the sum of the speech. The genius of American diplomacy was building institutions that would advance American interests by serving others. You'll recall we began as a colony. We discovered we didn't much like the restrictions that came with that, and we exerted some effort to create our own government and change our relationship with Great Britain and the world. 
Our founding fathers were escaping an efficient government, the British monarchy. They set out to create an inefficient government, the better to protect individual rights and freedoms enumerated in our foundation documents. On the efficiency, inefficiency side, you might look at things today and figure they overachieved. We began trading across the Pacific before we had a west coast. A ship aptly named the Empress of China sailed from New York to Canton, China in February 1784. This 15 month voyage was highly profitable and it started a vigorous US-China trade. We could do that and we could profit from it now that we were not subject to colonial rule and taxes. In the first half of the 20th century, industrial age warfare devastated the world. The age of imperialism, colonialism, totalitarianism, fascism, Nazism, communism, you get it, restrictive trade practices and blood and soil nationalism destroyed empires, nations, and millions of lives. In 1914, when war was considered illogical and unlikely, an itinerant worker killed Archduke Ferdinand and his wife in Sarajevo. He sparked an unexpected war of unprecedented carnage. More than 8 million died fighting the war and perhaps 13 million civilians died as a result of the conflict. Four major empires, each bearing responsibility for the war, collapsed. The Russian, the Austro-Hungarian, the German, and the Ottoman. The Versailles Treaty, signed in 1919 on the anniversary of the Archduke's assassination, marked the formal end of this world war. We assumed the world was now safe for democracy that the threat was no more. But the treaty was punitive and it nourished the conditions that created war to return. As a result, less than 20 years later, a much larger global war emerged with even more destructive weapons. As that second global cataclysm was, was concluding and recognizing that imperialism and the other isms bring catastrophe and mere treaties are not enough, the United States convened a conference of allies and others from 44 countries at a place called the Mount Washington Hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire on 1 July 1944. The plans for the conference did not encourage optimism. The hotel had been closed for two years. The town was so small that mail did not have to specify a street, just a name. We had one month to prepare for more than 700 delegates from 44 countries. The hotel manager took a bottle of liquor and locked himself in his office, never to reappear again until the conference was over. President Roosevelt chose this location because its isolation from Washington meant less interference from home governments to all the countries attending. Their embassies were nowhere near Mount Washington. To be, and there was no entertainment in this small town, so there was nothing to do but work. And by the way, President Roosevelt wanted the Republican senator from New Hampshire to vote yes to the United Nations. The goal was no less than the design of an international security and global economic structure for the post-war world, one that would make the world safe for democracy and support free trade, prosperity, and peace. Recall that this conference occurred less than a month after the Allied invasion of Europe at Normandy. In the Pacific, the Battle of the Philippine Sea was over, but the invasion of the Philippines the battle, and the battles for the Marianas and for the Japanese homeland territories of Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and mainland Japan still lay ahead. While Allied victory was not assured, it was still probable. We actually did planning and organizing to win the peace in those days before we were assured that we'd win the war. I submit that that's an art that we've lost in the subsequent years. The Bretton Woods Conference created the Bretton Woods Economic Agreement of 1944. Among its achievements, the International Monetary Fund, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which led to the World Trade Organization, open markets, free trade, stable currencies, and collective defense. It ended economic, it attempted to end economic nationalism and protectionism. It promoted anti-colonialism and self-determination, much to the frustration of a couple of our important allies. Democracy promotion and support of free peoples everywhere was an explicit part of these agreements. 
This affected allies as well as enemies. The end of imperial preference and the end of uh, colonial empires badly aggrieved France and Great Britain, but end they did. The old order didn't die necessarily quietly, but following the end of the war, the old order did die in India, Egypt, Palestine, Israel, Indochina, Africa, Asia, and everywhere else. The new system has been called the liberal international order. It has lately been changed and most recently called the free and open Indo-Pacific, partly as a re result, in my opinion, of changing political language in the United States. Liberal has taken on a meaning that was not intended in the original construct. Another description of this system is the rule of law. In the wake of World War II, we briefly enjoyed a unipolar moment by virtue of our, of our situation as the only undamaged major power. It lasted only a brief five years as our major assumptions proved wrong. The Soviet Union and Uncle Joe Stalin did not prove to be cooperative. The Soviets blockaded West Berlin to force us out. We airlifted supplies to the population and kept our forces in West Berlin. Significant, especially in those days, Germany had just ceased being our enemy. The Soviets subjected much of Eastern Europe and exploded their own atomic weapons. In China, the Communist Rebellion defeated our wartime ally, Chiang Kai-shek, and USSR-backed forces in North Korea invaded South Korea, and US military forces returned to Asia and to Europe. But what did survive was the Bretton Woods Agreement. In support of this new order, we provided significant resources to Europe through the Marshall Plan to help her war-torn countries rebuild and resist communist coercion. The Lend Lease during the war was, quote, the most unsorted act in history, unquote, according to Winston Churchill. The post-war Marshall Plan had to be a close second. Japan's post-war constitution emerged in support of and in the spirit of the Bretton Woods Agreement. This system allowed Japanese industry, talent, and devotion to the nation to achieve Asia's first economic miracle. This system is what allowed the US and what we used to call the free world to endure throughout the Cold War and its many hot campaigns and to prevail in the ex existential struggle with the Soviet Union without yet another great war. The collapse of the Soviet Union put paid at least temporarily to Karl Marx's vision of communism as a global government. It also led us to believe, again, just as we had at the end of World War I and World War II, that there was nobody left to fight and no longer any challenge to the liberal democratic order. One great scholar with a cal solid California connection, Francis Fukuyama, declared, quote, what we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such, that is the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. Wow, we used to talk like that in those days. We believed that back in the day. We thought we were in another unipolar moment in the last victim, the last, last villain had been vanquished and life was going to be good. In this heady atmosphere, we once again felt the world was safe for democracy. We assumed that China's reintegration into the global economic system would liberalize China as it became prosperous. We read positive motives in Deng Xiaoping's personal diplomacy and we read meaning into cryptic statements like to get rich is glorious and hide and buy. But we were, until recently, slow to notice that China, under Deng's successors, was not fulfilling our hopes of the triumph of Western liberal democracy. President Xi believes the state must have the strongest role in an increasing economic power to drive political and military power. State control of economic power is China's model. Xi wants to drive the US away from Asian defense and trade. The China model of economic growth without political liberty is believed to be superior to the global order that we and our allies created. As China and other authoritarian, authoritarian states rise, we're losing what we gained. 
Freedom House declares that political rights and civil liberties have declined around the world over the last 13 years. One third of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the center of the world's fastest growing middle class, is dominated by Beijing. Why did we lose our way? Because we thought that liberal democracy's dominance was assured. No more work required, no more messy involvement in global affairs. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and its empire, we, the United States, lost the object, the central organizing principle that compelled, shaped, and coordinated our policies and strategies from about 1950 until 1990. We have yet to replace it. A struggle against communism inspired us to support human rights, democracy, and capitalism. We backed our principles with foreign aid and investment that developed both capabilities and capacity. And we got far more back from our investments over time than we put in. We promoted unity and helped the world adopt a better way. Germany and Japan, recent enemies, became economic miracles. We spoke eloquently through rhetoric and action to captive populations and nations with authoritarian rulers. South Korea moved from a military dictatorship to a robust, vigorous democracy, and by the way, a prosperous one. Taiwan ended martial law and military dictatorship to become, become another Asian democratic and economic success story. Some who survived political captivity speak eloquently to us now. Natan Sharansky, a political prisoner of the Soviet Union for nine years, speaks about free societies and what he calls fear societies and dictators. Quote, when we are unwilling to draw clear moral lines between free societies and fear societies, when we are unwilling to call the former good and the latter evil, we will not be able to advance because of peace, because peace cannot be disconnected from freedom. The only peace that can be made with a dictator is one that must be based on deterrence. For today, the dictator may be your friend, but tomorrow he will need you as an enemy." End quote. We must recognize that we and our democratic allies and partners are in an existential contest with those who seek lifetime tenure, continuously expanding territory, total authority, state-controlled economies, and obedient subjects. We need to realize that peace, freedom, and a lawful world order will not exist without U.S. leadership and support. Fortunately, we have some recent guidance that speaks to this from an unexpected source. Our most recent national security strategy published in 2018 is one of the very best such recent documents. It speaks to the universal values and principles that are the foundation of our power and leadership. It bears a striking similarity to the spirit of Bretton Woods that got us and the free world through the Cold War without another global war. It's a quick read by government document standards at, only, at less than 60 pages, but let me give you just a couple paragraphs out of it. It says, in part, around the world, nations and individuals admire what America stands for. We treat people equally and value and uphold the rule of law. We have a democratic system that allows the best ideas to flourish. We know how to grow economies so that individuals can achieve prosperity. These qualities have made America the richest country on earth, rich in culture, talent, opportunities, and material wealth. We will continue to champion American values and offer encouragement to those struggling for human dignity in their societies. There can be no moral equivalency between nations that uphold the rule of law, empower women, and respect individual rights and those who brutalize and suppress their people. Through our words and deeds, America demonstrates a positive alternative to political and religious despotism." End quote. So the big question now is will we stand behind our words or will this strategy, like many other government proclamations, become yet another dusty government document residing on the shelf somewhere? As I said at the beginning, we need to remember who we are and act in accordance with our principles. Once we do that, the rest, the whole complex execution of policy and strategy will be as fraught with human frailty and fallibility as always, but at least our direction, our, in, our intended movement will be clear and bright. And the world will be the better for it, and so will we. And I await your questions.
Hey, General, thank you very much. And uh, 